Hey guys, I know it's been uh, a while we've been putting it mildly uh, since my last video essay. Simply put, a mixture of burnout, low views and uni kicking into gear kinda kicked my ass for a while when it came to making new content. But I'm back baby, magpie stocks are rising once again! And today? Well, I'm talking once again about cartoon redemptions, because that went, well, last time, but in a slightly different vein. Enemies to lovers. Or, well, the enemies to at least very good friends that blush at each other, but that doesn't work quite so well as a title. Now, when it comes to characters starting out as enemies and ending up lovey-dovey, in my personal opinion, limited to this is what Zuko is to redemption arcs when it comes to story-driven cartoons. It's not perfect, very little piece of writing is, but I would argue that it is a standout part of a very standout show. The one thing Lumity has over everything else on this list is time. Screen time to be exact, and well, it's less like a close call and more like a hydrogen bomb versus several coughing babies. Katra and Adora and Anne and Sasha aren't even allies until the very final season of their respective shows. The former spends 4 out of 5 seasons on very opposite sides of the war, while the latter only interacts in about 4 episodes until Anne returns to a new and redeemed Sasha. And that's not even to mention Dipper and Pacifica, who have even worse of a problem. There's only really one single episode where Pacifica interacts with him as not a spoiled bully, before moving on to comics. Meanwhile, Luz and Amity get the entire show. Season 1 to show Amity softening from a harsh, bullying rival to blushy friend, quotation marks and season 2 gets the two of them together before the halfway mark. It's like someone took a long hard look at the enemies to lovers pipeline and converted it into an equation to figure out the perfect point for introduction, rivalry, friendship, crushing and romance, instead of it properly happening in the comics or in the last half season of the show, or even the finale, it happens halfway through. Well what was meant to be halfway through the show, you know what I mean. Still, time isn't everything, you can still make a really good story in a really short amount of time, any over the garden wall fan will tell you that. I'd much rather have a short, super well written relationship than a long, drawn out, just okay one. And I should point out that I don't think any of these relationships are just okay, mediocre. Some have more flaws than others, to be sure, but the biggest criticism I could levy would be missed potential. But even the ones that are more potential than results must clearly have something there. Good god, have you seen how many fans Dipsifica still has? In fact, that's probably a good spot to focus on these two for a moment. Specifically, their relationship in Northwest Mansion Mystery, because everything before this episode is just not really relevant. And that might sound like a negative, but it's actually a positive in this case. The episode sets up their relationship perfectly with one of the funniest gags in the series, before moving on to connect us and Dipper to the Harris, impressively quickly developing her from shallow rich kid to something more layered. It seems to be a pretty common trope within this trope, to have the redeemed love interest be more popular slash well off than our protagonists, but considering Pacifica was essentially the modern day blueprint for this, it's actually pulled off surprisingly well. Of course, what's not pulled off well at all is Weird Mageddon not long afterwards, where she has apparently completely reverted to her previous shallow rich bully persona. Like, she doesn't even have that much relevance in the finale, but every line she does have is just a rich person joke and not much more. It's easily one of the weakest writing choices in the otherwise really watertight Gravity Falls, impressively so. Typically when characters do things and change, that thing sticks around and keeps its impact for the rest of the show. So I think it's a real shame that, in the grand scheme of things, one of the best episodes in the show, what seems pivotal at first glance, is just completely skippable and you would not miss a single story beat. 
Help, the repaired laptop, its mysterious countdown, and the Northwest ties to Bill Cipher are just kind of never come up again? Northwest Mansion Mystery is still easily a top 10 episode of the show, but I think it could be top 3, if not the best, if not for the resulting non answers. However, if we are going to talk about writing an enemies to lovers relationship, I don't think there's one that's more interesting and layered to talk about here than Adora and Catra. And in this case, the common conversation I've seen across the net is, are they good for each other? And speaking of goods, it would be really good if you could like and subscribe, let the algorithm know I'm back in business. Okay, sorry for the bother. And I want to go down into that route of, are they good for each other? Because I think this works both to the show's advantage and its detriment over the other examples. While the other shows do touch on abuse via the families of Amity and Pacifica, the latter is usually pretty comedic in tone and the former doesn't have too much time to be developed with everything else going on. Shira, on the other hand, makes it a pivotal aspect of both its main characters, their relation with each other and other characters, i.e. Shadow Weaver, and yes, eventually their romance. And that's where the difficulties come in, because in my opinion, when it comes to Katra, over season 1 to 4, everything she does makes perfect sense when it comes to her character and her backstory. It works well narratively during the enemies stage, I have no issues with it. The problems come in the final season when the two of them are allies and the narrative is clearly setting them up to be something more. And Katra hasn't changed. With the others, by the time the two are romantically involved, or at least have the potential to be, you the viewer don't have any concerns, you can clearly see why that would happen. Amity has changed as a person, opening up, voluntarily falling from her toxic social status, selflessly defending Luz, the works. Sasha almost dies defending the town she once tried to conquer and makes it very clear she is desperate to not repeat past mistakes. Even the arguably least developed duo clearly gain a new, positive connection once Pacifica is able to break away from her parents. The Adora Catra situation is a little different, because of course they are in a different situation in season 5, working together for the first time since episode 1, but, well, not only are Catra's many war crimes and kind of murders of main characters go overlooked, but unlike the other examples here, which actually showcase positive aspects of their respective relationships, Katra and Adora continue to be… negative to say the least. Now here's the thing, if the show wasn't so positive about them finally getting together, I'd be absolutely fine with this, but well, let's just say it doesn't. Take a look at this quick clip from Amphibia. It's not easy. Forgiveness is hard, and it can take time, but believe me, it's worth it. I mean, just look at what you and I have now. It's a powerful little scene, even if the two are never full on shown to be romantic. But it's something that Katra and Adora just don't have when they finally kiss. Something positive to show for it, and it just feels unearned because of that. Katra wants Adora to love her unequivocally, and often resorts to tactics that feel very reminiscent of something like Shadow Weaver would do. She never seemed to regret her manipulation, and as a result it feels kind of… icky. Now, before the Cadora fans descend on me again, I just want to say that A, this ship can have some wholesome moments to it, and B, Catra was abused. This show makes that point very clear. However, that excuse can only go so far. It's so frustrating because I feel like if the result of this relationship was at least a little more grey, you know, whether it's a good thing or not, then it would actually be pretty masterful. But as it stands, it ends four seasons of violent back and forth between two messy, emotional, unstable, manipulated girls with an ending that's much too happy for its own good. It's cathartic, yes. But it feels like we haven't earned this level of happiness, they still have a lot to work through. And maybe they do work through it, but it's not like we see it. 
maybe we will one day in the form of spin-off comics like Gravity Falls does. Hey, what a transition! Okay, here is where I think a lot of the shipping feel for these two comes into play. There's a lot of banter between them, yes, but under that you can also see where a lot of genuine care comes from on both ends. It feels like the sequel to Northwest Mansion Mystery that we never got, which I suppose makes a lot of sense, you know, Lost Legends. I would highly recommend it, they're all great little reads. These two still end up being the most underdeveloped couple of the four, with Dipper and Pacifica's relationship being little more than a footnote in the show instead of a major focus like the other three, but it had a lot of potential, and I look forward to seeing if it appears at all in Bill Cipher's book, or beyond? Eh? Eh? More Gravity Falls content, please? Anyway, I don't have a cool transition this time, so let's talk about Anne and Sasha now. I think it's a shame that the human girls have completely taken over the fan base instead of, you know, the frogs that appear in the show ten times more than Sasha and Marcy combined, but I'd be lying if I said I don't see why. To focus on Sasha, her relationship with Anne takes us through what is some of easily the best moments of the series, the season one final battle, the battle of the bands, a large part of True Colours, the big finale, etc. But what I do like about Anne and Sasha's relationship is that it's the only one that flip-flops over the course of the story. With kind of the exception of Catra and Adora, but like it's literally only episode one that they stand in good terms, so with Sasha and Anne it goes from them being the best of friends to enemies, to this cat and mouse dynamic of wondering how and if a betrayal is going to happen, to I mean, I don't know how I describe their relationship during the finale of True Colours, but it's kind of awesome, you can understand both sides, and then the final makeup and redemption in season 3. None of it feels forced, and you get to see Sasha both deeply regret and atone for her actions, that's the important part, and while the likes of Amity and Pacifica didn't do this level of atonement, they were also just, you know, kind of nasty bullies in comparison to the ravaging conqueror queens that Sasha and Catra were, however briefly. Anyway, we're just running out of time now, so what did I think of these relationships then, personally? Well, I like Dipper and Pacifica, they're a nice duo that I really wish interacted more, and I think Alex thinks the same, but at this point it is definitely up to the fans more than anything else. Sasha and Anne, big highlight of Amphibia for me, I still can't believe we never got more Sasha focused episodes in any season. Were they not as popular or something? Catra and Adora, whew, okay that's a doozy. Uh, might have to make a whole video on it one day, but my opinion of it is still the same as it was in my Villain Redemption video. It's a really excellent dynamic for four seasons, but it doesn't quite stick the landing in the finale. And losing Amity, look, I'm gonna be honest, Lumity kind of carries a lot of season 1, at least in my opinion. I've heard talk that these two are genuinely one of the best, most developed sapphic relationships in media in general, and I can see where they're coming from. So yeah, that's it, just a simpler video to start the year off. Thank you so much if you're still listening to this, that means you've gotten all the way to the end and you can hear me say this, I'm back! Thanks for watching.